Hi, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be rejoining you. Um, so today, uh, giving a talk called Five Locks, which will, of course, involve five locks. Only a couple of them are sitting right in front of me, but I'll give you a quick overview of what we're talking about today. So first, actually, before I begin, um, I just want to give a thank you to some folks. I have no idea how they feel about the attribution, but they'll know who they are. Uh, I was recently um, reconnected with an old friend who convinced me to re-engage with um, a bunch of old friends and some new people in the Locksport community. Uh, and it's been a really long time. I've kept a tiny parochial life and it has been really good for me and really lovely, but I've maintained my research all of these years. So uh, getting back into any sort of a public facing situation wouldn't have happened without the community um, that has always been there and that I've uh, finally been able to reconnect with. So thank you to all of those who've kept those fires burning and invited and welcomed me back in. I really appreciate it. And here I am as a result. So today we're gonna talk about five different locks. Uh, the first one isn't technically a lock, it's a door seal. And if you're thinking, oh, I've heard him talk about door seals before, you totally have. Um, you're going to hear a little more about the door seals and that first key based lock, the Shikatu lock. Um, but today, rather than exploring those origins and trying to sort of reinforce that theory, what I want to talk about instead is the role of each of those technologies in the societies that they were a part of and how they helped develop those societies as well. Then we're going to get into some of the locks in the XLOX project and looking at some patent diagrams in general. Um, and then going on from that, we're going to talk about how we research locks so that we can actually um, open them. Uh, and not just open the single lock that's in front of us, but doing that sort of research so that we can gain permanent access to a lock and also to understand how to pick an entire system of locks. So we're gonna, really gonna run the gamut here across these five locks, but hopefully there's a little bit of a narrative through line that makes sense to all of us. And then finally, uh, my goal is to wrap up by 12. And then if anyone's interested, I'll gladly stick around for about another 30 minutes for a Q&A, but the main comment of the talk will be over by then. Uh, and if anybody has to bounce earlier, no worries. This is all be recorded as well. Awesome. Thank you all so much for uh, welcoming me back also. Um, in general, I'll be ignoring the chat until the Q&A, but feel free to talk to each other. Uh, and if you have questions in there, I'll try to uh, slide back to those as well as I go uh, into the Q&A portion. <laughs> all right. First time in a long time. So. As you all know, I uh, really like locks. And I've liked locks for an incredibly long time. And a big part of why I transitioned from picking competitively to really studying deeply the history of locks is that I arrived at this point where I was being beaten pretty regularly as a competitive lock picker. Um, uh, Jay Gore was the first one to really school me, just to take me to school in the finals at the American Open at DEF CON many years ago. Um, he opened both of the locks that were put in front of us in the final, and I failed to open either of them, and I still have one of them. And uh, if I'm being honest, I still haven't opened it. And so I came to understand that the next generation of lock pickers were gonna be a lot better than me. But I loved all of it, and I loved the community, and I just hated the idea that I wouldn't have something to, to contribute in the way that I had before. So, uh, I began kind of stretching myself, looking for anything that I could find, and I started reading histories of locks and quickly found that many of the histories were corporate histories. Um, there's an incredible book put out by um, the founder of Lips, um, which is excellent and, and really, really well done and well researched, but also has, you know, portions of it have been taken into canon and into the Encyclopedia Britannica and so on and so forth, but didn't actually have the sort of rigor that a uh, that a more professional historian would have brought to it. Additionally, uh, in the course of just picking locks, you come across people with really remarkable um, reactions to even finding out that you can do that, much less seeing you do that in front of them. And so I became really interested in what that emotional and social piece of security was. Those two things, beginning to look into the history and kind of seeing that there might be a niche there and just those interpersonal reactions and how fascinated I am to begin with, really led me down this path of studying the history and anthropology of security technologies. Uh, and I've never looked back. I've, I've found an even deeper love for all of this, doing this work than, than I ever had when picking. So 
I want to tell you about Adas Elizada. He is a researcher at the University of Chicago and their Oriental Institute. Back in 1985, he was just trying to figure out what he should write his doctoral thesis on. And he was looking at different data sets and he had an advisor direct him to um, findings from 1937 at a site called Tal e Bakun A. -E. Um, he would later write all of this up in, uh, in a large paper, a book called The Origins of State Organizations in Prehistoric Highland Fars, Southern, Ar Southern Iran, which you can find via the University of Chicago. Uh, and he said that as he was looking for a subject, he started looking through these old records. Again, at that point, they were 50 years old, these excavations, and people had already written about them. But as he said, as it was known in the literature, I considered Tal e Bakun A as a small farming village with beautiful pottery and not much social complexity. My opinion soon changed when I found a large collection of ceilings, particularly door ceilings that had been found at the site. Now, the reason that his opinion had been changed is that the very presence of door ceilings means that there's any sort of routing, any sort of structure being given to the spaces in which people operate. It's the foundation of private, public, and semi-private spaces. You know, private spaces, you know, potentially for an individual or, or a family, your public space, obviously, anybody moving in and out of any of your semi-private spaces, which are meant to be occupied by groups of people, but explicitly some sort of in-group of people and not by whatever the out-group there uh, is. Uh, and then you also have your semi-public spaces, which in theory are open to anyone, sometimes time limited, sometimes socially limited, even if not explicitly so. All of this around uh, public, private, semi-public, semi-private is super interesting to me in general, especially in a more modern context. But there, at the dawn of, of early civilization, still in prehistory, um, Adas goes on to say, that we take the evidence of door ceilings at Tal e Bakun A as representing a transitional stage in which social organizations based on kinship evolved into more permanent, impersonal social forms, laying the foundation for later state organizations. So the suggestion here is that the door ceiling itself, the very fact of its presence, means that there is something organizing this community beyond kinship, beyond familial ties, that there is a, a social organization happening and some sort of administrative organization happening as well. He goes on to say something that uh, the first time that I read it just electrified me. Uh, and it was very exciting just to read these words again as I was prepping for this talk. But he says, uh, door ceilings may be taken as the earliest tangible evidence of the evolutionary transition from a tribal to a civilized society as that term is, uh, is currently defined. And the idea that this thing that I, I love, that I'm already so passionate about, could be there not only at the dawn of civilization, but also be an explicit signifier of the creation of civilization was incredibly powerful and changed how I thought about security technologies writ large. It took me down a path of studying uh, this idea that security technologies take on very special roles at moments of large societal transition. And then throughout other areas of research that I've done, I, I do believe that I'm finding that to be true. And Lord knows it'll probably be another six years of my life before I can really uh, explain that in any sort of brief way, but it just led me down even more exciting areas of research. So the reason that he's able to um, make these claims about it really creating this new form of organization is not just related to the fact that the technology existed, but the way in which it existed at that site. In particular, these are the door ceilings. So uh, there were all sorts of other seals. But these were the main marks left by the actual like stone or, or carved piece that would be pressed into the seal to mark it. So the door ceiling, you just have a piece of clay, uh, and then the clay has to be broken in order to open the door. Often there's a stick running through it with a string, um, but ultimately the important thing is that in order to open the door, you have to break the seal that's on there. So it isn't a strong physical protection. However, it does give you some sort of administrative record. And if you are you know, one of the few people that is supposed to access the space and you see the seal broken, 
but not resealed with the appropriate seal, you'll know that something has been tampered with or that somebody has trespassed, um, or at least have good reason to suspect that. Now, interestingly, the rest of this chart is just describing the various places that they found each of these things. Now, importantly, there were a couple of them that were only found at single sites, and there were a couple of sites that only had a single seal found at them. But many of the seals are used in the same buildings as one another, sometimes even pressed into the same sealing so that different holders of the seal, whether families or individuals or other social groups, had access to the same spaces. So there were not only private spaces, but there were explicitly these semi-private spaces, um, which creates a, which demonstrates a much more complex flow and organization of human beings, uh, and thus the, the, the very compelling argument that this is uh, a significant transition um, the rest of his work on all of this is absolutely fascinating, but um, what's exciting is that you have, in particular, um, like building four here has one, two, three different types of seal that appear throughout it, uh, and in significant numbers as well. Um, and it just goes to demonstrate that though we don't necessarily know what was in there, what was kept in there, we do have a better understanding of how that space may have been used um, and who had access to it and what that implied for their society as a whole. Rad. Uh, and this was many thousands of years ago, 6,000-ish years ago. I can get a real number on that, but a um, long time ago, prehistory. Awesome. So uh, the key then, that, that, that seal becomes something really remarkable beyond just this demonstration of civilization. It also becomes a, a shibboleth made manifest. So a shibboleth is, is anything that is a, a cultural signifier, verbal um, uh, clothing, so on and so forth. Something that allows you to quickly understand if somebody is within your in-group uh, or are in the out-group. Um, it is a way of identifying some sort of kinship without actually knowing the individual, right? Like a passphrase sort of thing. And this then becomes one of the earliest physical manifestations of such a thing, where breaking out of these actual familial structures of being able to recognize the person that is across from you, having the same language even, potentially, though obviously this is one small community, so that's extrapolating a lot but it creates this token of authority, this token of access to shared private spaces. So the people that are able to gather in a semi-private space might not necessarily be of the same family, but might be of the same business, might be of the same something else. And it is that seal, that seal that demonstrates their ability to access it, that would allow someone, whether they are known to the group or not, to have that authority to be present in that space, to use that space, and to be together with the other members of that community. It becomes a really powerful um, metaphor in addition to its actual power as a physical object in these communities. And you can actually see that as we then make the transition into key-based locks. Now, the transition into key-based lock, key locks, I talk about a great deal in my origins of the, of the lock. Um, paper and talks that I've given. Specifically, the really wonderful thing is that a big piece of the evidence for the transition from these door seals into the first keyed lock is the fact that there's a linguistic connection between the two. The peg that is put through the hole of the door seal has the same name as the pins in the first pin lock. So this linguistic evolution implies then this mechanical evolution. And there's artifactual evidence to help back this up as well. But that that wound up being the centerpiece of the argument um, kind of excited and fascinated me. And, and the very way in which the, uh, Dr. Daniel Potts is the, the one whose first paper I read on this sort of redefining this series of terms. Effectively, a handful of people had done research on early locking mechanisms, door hardware in ancient Mesopotamia uh, and Assyria. And he said, you know, I'm looking at all of these terms. I'm seeing what everybody's producing, but here's the set of about seven, maybe eight individual words. They appear together all the time, 
And if you take everybody else's research at face value, they're using them redundantly. You know, they're saying the word bolt two times in the same sentence, but using different words. It didn't make sense to him. Now, the reason that the terms had been defined in the way that they had been defined, effectively, they were describing a much simpler mechanism than a keyed lock. Instead, they were describing, you know, a bolt running through a staple, maybe with a handle on it, so on and so forth. A very simple technology. The reason for that was that there wasn't much in the artifactual record that would suggest otherwise. In fact, there was very little that would suggest they had anything other than that. <clears throat> One of the interesting things that, um, that archaeologists would do would actually be to sort of take an impression of the back of a, uh, of, of a piece of door hardware to try to interpret what the technology might have been by seeing that relief. Um, and all of those came back as fairly non-complex. The physical pieces that were found, the pieces of key-based locks that were being found were made of metal and thus were um, typically of a later age. In general, things that were being made out of wood don't last. So we didn't necessarily have a strong artifactual connection to this, but what Daniel Potts said was, if we just assume that the lock existed, and instead of using this much simpler conception of the lock to define this big constellation of terms, instead, why don't we assign each one of these to an individual component of a keyed lock? Now, the keyed lock that he was talking about is basically this. I mean, not this one specifically, but this style of wooden lock. Now, this is either the, this might be the Dogon of Mali. Um, there are a number of communities in Mali who produce absolutely gorgeous pin-based keyed locks. And the way that this works is that there is a, grab my, <clears throat> in here, you'll see a number of little pegs. Each of these little metal heads is a pin. And if we allow them to, well, in our case, drop, because we can flip the whole lock upside down, but if they're able to get out of the way of the bolt, they can then let the bolt slide free. Now, the way that this would work is that you would slide a big wooden key in through the bolt itself. That would push up your individual tumblers, and then you could slide the bolt out. Now, this is a mechanism that's very well known to a lot of people, especially a lot of people in the lock world. And in general, it was called the Egyptian lock. This is for all sorts of interesting reasons, again, that are well covered in that origins project. But importantly, we knew, and Dr. Ponce knew, that that technology had existed within, you know, a thousand years of the area that they were looking at, knew that it existed in similar geographies to where they were looking at, but it hadn't been seriously considered as the right technology for those sites. <clears throat> so what he did is he defined each of those individual words that he saw appearing in constellation with one another, and then he went to the cuneiform corpus and found references to locks and door hardware and bolts and whatnot and tried to redefine those passages that had previously been translated. And the one that just absolutely delighted me was that he found one with somebody requesting help to fix their lock. Specifically, it was for the Temple of Ishtar. And what they found was their Shikatu lock, which was the um, original term that for the a uh, bolt in the door seal that now is translated into the pin in the lock. So this is our Shikatu lock. Explicitly what it said is, you know, we're having trouble when one of the pins gets stuck on top of the bolt and isn't falling down into the hole that it is meant to fall down to. So the pin is getting on, stuck on top of the plug effectively and can't slide down into its pin chamber. And that's causing them trouble. And so he, when illustrating it, actually illustrated it this peg won't fall back down when it's in its locked position. And he went on to translate several more, but that was the one that got me very excited in particular, especially just because it was such an understandable thing. The fact that there was somebody who would receive that letter that would be able to go out and repair it, the fact that there was a proto locksmith that would work on that technology, um, was absolutely fascinating to me. And, uh, and Dr. Potts was absolutely wonderful in pointing me to some additional resources. Um, and again, all of that covered in the origins project. However, uh, 
what I think is really important there is that not only was he aware of contemporary technologies, but he understood really how they functioned and thus was able to look at the language being used and create a different picture based on his own like technical and mechanical knowledge. In his paper, he makes reference to um, the, the, the book by the founder of Lips, previous <clears throat> archeological uh, records, um, Bamani and uh, um, oh, another really good one. Anyway, he had learned about locks and keys and the technology that was present at the time and how it actually functioned and thus could infer how it might fail and what these people may have been trying to say to one another that had been previously misinterpreted. Now that idea of rediscovering these technologies through the lens of some sort of expertise with them became incredibly important to me when I began digging into the, the X-locks. Now the X-locks are uh, my term for the security related patents lost in the patent office fire of 1836. Now, many years ago, I launched this project having done a little bit of work myself um, and was very lucky, uh, had the opportunity to give a talk at layer one um, and then a very brief um, StoopCon talk at um, uh, uh, in Boston. Can't remember the name of the conference now. Regardless, what I had been doing was finding every piece of information I could about every security patent that had been lost um, most of them lost in their absolute entirety to the Patent Office fire of 1836. Now, this includes um, the, the first uh, pin-based patent filed by Abraham Oger Stansbury. Um, he, thankfully, though we have no record of it in um, the U.S. patent database whatsoever, thankfully, he also filed patent for what appears to be exactly the same technology in England at the time. And though the British Patent Office have digitized, but not yet made available um, their full patent archives, um, there were books published uh, summarizing them many, many years ago, uh, back in the late 1800s. Uh, and I was lucky enough to find the only extant copy I could find in any library at the um, one of the universities of one of the uh, at the University of Connecticut, one of their campuses. I don't remember which. Uh, but in their rare books archive. Um, and I reached out to the rare books librarian who said to me, hey, yeah, absolutely. I can track that down for you. I can scan it for you. Um, you know, because of the pandemic, it is going to be a long time before I'm going to be able to get this to you. And I said, hey, I've been looking for this thing for a decade. Um, I didn't even know the name of it. I had heard like rumors of its existence, these catalogs that um, recapped all of a given small area's patents to that time in England. Um, I had actually had rare booksellers tell me that they had existed and existed in America, but they couldn't find them for me. I finally found one in an adjacent category, um, got my hands on that. It was all about um, uh, like depositories and, and safes and safe rooms and things like that, which is interesting, but not necessarily within my niche. And reading through that, reading every entry um, through about a third of the book, all of a sudden I found at the bottom of it a note saying, you know, the locking mechanism is not here and described. You can find that in and the exact name of the volume that I've been looking for all these years without even knowing its name. And so once I had that, I could look for it on WorldCat and find, yes, literally the one copy. Um, in fact, I said University of Connecticut. I believe it was at Yale. Regardless, he told me that I was going to have to wait nine months. I said, that is completely fine. I have been waiting a decade, maybe more. Uh, and so it is just, it feels like a miracle that I will ever have it. Thank you so much. And was my normal effusive uh, uh, way to into everything I talk about self. Uh, and the next day he sent me an email because he had just had somebody digitize the whole thing that day. Uh, and so I had it and I was there reading the full patent specification for the first pin lock ever patented. Um, and it's interesting, and it's more interesting than I would have given it credit for. And there were also the original patent illustrations in there, which I definitely hadn't expected, because we'd never seen those before. Well, there are etchings of Stansbury's lock um, in a couple of places, but never the original patent illustrations. Again, these have existed, and they've continued to exist, and they are even digitized so that if you go into 
um, a, a research facility in England, you can get somebody to find these for you, bring them to you. You have to put a request in ahead of time, so on and so forth. Um, but that's not work that I was able to do. So this was um, absolutely remarkable. Anyhow, all of that said, Stansbury lock isn't actually lock number three. Lock number three is this guy, James Kyle. So James Kyle's lock was in fact lost in the patent office fire of 1836. His was filed in 1833, late 1833, um, and it concerns a, uh, a door lock, and that's basically what we had. Except that, unlike some of these, we were really lucky because we did have one page of his illustrations. We didn't have his full patent illustrations and we had not a word of the description of how the lock would work, but still exciting that we were at least starting from there. Now, what you'll find throughout the X locks and throughout the X patents in general is that occasionally you'll get like one page terribly scanned of somebody's handwriting from you know almost 300 years or 200 years ago. Um, and, and even that process, you know, when I got some volunteers from giving that original talk, I would give them this transcription project. And they would go through and they would do their best to read the handwriting and to write what they thought that it was saying. And the places where we consistently saw gaps was exactly what I was talking about with Daniel Potts, where we arrived at this place where the best guess that someone without the knowledge of the technology and the terminology for that technology contemporaneous with what they're trying to translate. So not only knowing what we call every part of a lock right now and how all sorts of different locks work, but also knowing the terminology that was being used and the trends in the technology around that time. Without all of that foreknowledge, people took their best guesses and it quickly sort of turned into this telephone situation where one word wouldn't make a ton of sense, but then they would make it make sense, figure out what it might be, and then that might inform the next one, inform the next one. And that would often sort of stand alone as its own little thought, and then they would get back into things that made sense and they were able to understand. But each of those passages that wasn't perfectly transcribed and understood led to an overall confusion and an inability to put together the whole picture of the lock that we were then studying. So what I started having folks do is the moment they reached a point of uncertainty, they just bracketed that section off and, and allowed me to come in and, and review it. Um, and frequently I was able to even describe to them what it was that I was seeing that they may not have been seeing. I think it was kind of a fun experience, I hope, for the couple of folks that joined me in the transcription. Um, but with James Kyle, we don't have any handwritten documents. And also we were never, thus far at least, able to find the full specification of his patent. But what we did have was this drawing. Now this does give us quite a bit. We see a key here, maybe another key, or maybe a variation on this key. We see some sort of, some sort of bolt work, some sort of ladder-like object, the face of the lock with what looks like it might be two keyholes, not entirely sure, um, probably a side view of a lever pack if we compare this to other contemporaneous documents, um, and just an overall view, potentially of uh, installation options of it. Now, seeing all of this, my expectation would be that there might be one additional page showing um, the actual interaction of these components, which would be super useful if we were just trying to visually decode it. But unfortunately, we didn't have that. <clears throat> and we can make some inferences, but um, one of the very exciting things about these earliest patents is that often you're seeing things that they don't have a direct contemporary for. Um, because these are some of the earliest ideas. They might be building on something, but they might be taking it in a direction that feels a little bit foreign. So the first thing that we were able to find um, on James Kyle's lock was a single um, paragraph, like four sentences in the Franklin Institute um, who put out uh, for a very long time these great little snippets of various things that were being patented. Um, incredible resource if you're studying um, the history of any technology, really, especially in America. Uh, so it reads, uh, first patented May 18th, 1832, patent surrendered and reissued. Uh, we gave a full notice of the construction of this lock in volume 10. The end. And volume 10 wasn't available at the time. Uh, and once again, I'm sure that there are specific people that you, the specific places that I could go to have gathered that information. But also once again, this is not, um, <laughs> mobility as a researcher is an incredible luxury and unfortunately not one that I've typically had. 
Now, uh, I've continued to pick at every place of my passion over many years, and before terribly long, Volume 10 did suddenly become available. It had been scanned somewhere and added to Google's massive corpus of, uh, of, of literature from this period, um, and thus, I was able to get my hands on it. However, it is important to note that what we are looking at is his specification from 1833. And what this is referencing is the patent from May 18th, 1832. Now, if you missed it in that original paragraph that we found, it said patent surrendered and reissued on an amended specification, which is to say what they've described previously might not actually match what we're looking at. So we at this point are in volume 10 have found a few paragraphs describing how the lock functions. However, it isn't exactly the lock that we have an image of. And now we need to take that same sort of experience looking through all of these things and try to mesh them together into a single idea and really understand that illustration. Even if we'll never be able to recover the full specification, my, my hope and goal with every one of these patents is to someday create the physical object so that this thing that was dreamed up by someone 200 years ago can be extant again, can have some material presence in the world. I think that that's a, a, a very exciting idea to be able to physically hold one of these things in your hand. Um, and additionally, for those that we can never get there, I would like to at least be able to tell some of the stories of the people that did this sort of work. All right, so what we have um, from our picture of the amended patent and our description Right off the bat, they start by saying, the parts of this lock upon which the patentee rests his claim cannot be accurately described without a drawing. So thank goodness we have something. Um, quite a bit of description that is not unique to this lock, but just talking about how the bolt work in a lever lock would work generally, in a spring lock. Uh, but then they get to the interesting piece. Behind the bolt, there is a number of flat, thin levers made of plates of metal and working on a pin. Each of these has a projecting piece on its end, which falls into a notch in the bolt, retaining it in its position. The catch pieces upon these levers differ in length, and they require, therefore, to be raised in different degrees in order to disengage the bolt and allow it to act. It then goes on to describe the key. Of the key, it says the projecting pieces on the key are formed of thin metallic plates, like that of the lever latches. These slide over the shank of the key and are secured by a nut on its end. So... Those of you that have a sense of locks from <clears throat> that era, a lot of this might actually sound pretty familiar to you. However, looking at our actual diagram, we don't quite see what they're describing. In particular, um, though we have notches in the bolt, uh, we don't have a uh, the, the thin lever that's being described with a protrusion, protrusion that notches in the bolt doesn't really look like what we would expect. The key itself has a very different shape than you would expect from a lever key. Um, and the fact that that is only describing it operating in one orientation turns out not to have much to do with this reissue. So we're going to focus in just on the components that we have a really, really um, you know, unique and clear view of. So what's interesting here is that first, these turn out to be the levers. And the notches now, unlike in that description, are in either side of the bolt rather than just a single side. And thus, the bolt work itself curves around where the lever pack would be located. So these protrusions on our little ladder shape are actually keeping the bolt in place. And remarkably, they're moving in both directions. Now, any of you that have ever pulled apart a wafer lock or learned how to pick one likely know that your double-sided wafer lock operates on the same principle, but this is from 1833. Effectively, with the wafer lock, your tumbler goes up into an upper chamber or down into a lower chamber, and if you move it too far in one direction or the other, it just gets caught in that opposite chamber, and that's how it becomes double acting. What we mean by double acting is that you can neither lift it too high nor too low. You have to lift it to an exact point. Same with these, and they can operate in opposite directions. That also helps explain the roundness of the key, and they helpfully provide a couple of different of what we can assume are bits on the key. So this would be an, uh, likely an uncut uh, or perhaps even a spacing bit. This is a single-sided, and this then would be the double-sided that might operate uh, on either. 
Um, we can see now the sort of pattern of that is protruding from either side and thus will be meant to pull the levers into a center uh, position. Uh, and then finally, we have our other key over here. Now, this one had confused me at first because in the original um, description, there either was no second key and this very much did not look like it could operate on what we were now understanding this little trifecta of images to be describing. This, I believe, is the replacement for what had been a hand lever. The hand lever would have gone in this position, uh, but in one of our other drawings now, we no longer see a lever. And I believe, though I could be mistaken, that this key is now carried with you to provide the actual levering action on the bolt after you've put your user key in and set the uh, tumblers. So that's a lock that hasn't uh, existed in almost 200 years. But because we have this foreknowledge, because of the study of all of the things around it, the very fact that this was doing something new and unique even though we didn't have the actual specification or even the description of the lock that we were looking at, but instead a previous one um, that this was modified from, we have a really good understanding now of how it operated and how we could potentially recreate it, rebuild it, bring it back into the world. Um, and that's thrilling. I don't know if it's as thrilling to anyone in this world as much as it is to me, but hopefully you can borrow a little of my, my, my large well of passion. All right, so for all of you lock pickers out there, um, learning this stuff, digging into the history, looking at patents, pulling these things apart and learning what came before are also a huge and incredibly useful research tool. So anytime that you're approaching a lock, <clears throat> you can either be focusing on getting through it once, getting through it consistently, really, you know, opening it over and over and again, really understanding that individual lock, or you can aim to get permanent access or even figure out how to attack the entire system of locks. So this is where you go from working on an individual lock and getting really, really good with your hand technique uh, to understanding the core functionality of it and how you might apply that understanding to other locks that you're approaching, how you might refine other techniques and how you might, if you're able to, even derive the key or combination and thus gain permanent access to it as well. So just another fun patent dive on this um, that then ties sort of right into um, a lock in my own house this is L.J. Cooper's permutation lock. This, uh, along with a little Victor safe, is going to be lock number four for us. Now, what we can see in here, um, in particular, what I really want you to note is that we have, um, you know, this indexed and this we can see indexed up to 60 numbers. So if we have three wheels in there and 60 possibilities per wheel, uh, I believe that you do the number of tumblers to the power of their changes. Um, so that would be three to the 60th. It's a pretty, pretty decent key space. Um, we have a second page of illustrations. This is not an X lock. This is uh, from 1894. So we have the full patent specification. Um, really nice. Uh, so we can see everything kind of working together and whatnot. And we can figure out exactly how this functions. Um, there's some gearing, which is interesting. It, it, it's a nice little lock. Um, not terribly complex, not a huge departure of what's come before it. However, if we are instead looking at these patent illustrations in order to study how to defeat this or how to refine attacks against any of these locks that exist in the world, any one that this maker has made, what I would look at is that indexing up to 60 and then this right here, which is actually one of the internal tumblers. So. What some of you will notice right away is that there are only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Boy, is that right? Is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Only seven positions in which to put the fly. The fly is a piece of metal that connects one wheel to the next. The whole reason you have to spin multiple times in one direction when you're dialing in a safe is that you're only controlling one wheel, um, often not even a wheel that uh, uh, 
that the, the fence is riding along. But regardless, you're controlling one wheel, and then as it completes the full rotation, these two little pieces of metal, the flies link up together, and then you pick up the next wheel and the next and the next. So every time you dial, you dial in the opposite direction, you know, n minus one times, because you keep leaving wheels behind and you don't want to touch them again with that fly. <clears throat> so even though we're indexed up to 60 positions, if there are only nine positions to put the fly of the lock, that means there are only nine actual indices on each of these tumblers. Oh, sorry, seven. I keep saying nine, and I'll show you why in a moment. But three to the seventh is a dramatically smaller key space than uh, three to the sixtieth. And in particular, this can also tell us um, what ranges we can explore when we're trying to manipulate it as well um, and, and improve upon and refine attacks that we might take against the system. Now, if you are at all thinking, well, you know, we're looking at a random patent that you found out in the world, you're right. This is actually a relatively random patent I found out in the world because I was looking for both of those illustrations to be in one patent and you often get one or the other. But, uh, you know, I have a safe in my living room that we use as an end table, beautiful little safe. Uh, it is not a Mosler, but it effectively has a dial that looks incredibly similar to this. It just says Victor on it. And it has a hundred positions uh, indexed all the way around it. And then when you look inside of it, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine positions to actually place the fly. Nine positions that this could actually be combinated to. Now, you can also uh, you know, change exactly where those are in orientation to the dial, but that doesn't necessarily solve any sort of problem. In reality, especially for user key changes, if you want to change the combination of your lock, it gives you a dramatically smaller key space than the full theoretical key space that seems like it's being sold to you on the dial. And again, as an attacker, if you are trying to study this lock and, and find your way into one, it would behoove you to look at its patents, learn about what those limitations might already be. And additionally, because the patent might not give you all of the information, or the patent might suggest that you could have 50 user changes with very small holes, it's also worth it to own one of the locks that you're attempting to attack. Because when you can study a lock in front of you, especially one that you know the key to, the combination to, so on and so forth, you can then gain a lot more information about a lock that you want to attack. Cool. So uh, don't get seasick, but next we're going to slide this camera over to actually show you one of these attacks in the wild. So what I'm going to do is take just a small and quite frankly pretty cheap dial combination lock and we're gonna scope the inside of it in order to look through the shackle and decode it. Now, we're working on a lock that we actually already have a combination for, and the reason is exactly what I said a moment ago. We wanna study a lock that we control in order to figure out an attack that we could then carry out on another lock. In our case, what we're trying to do is figure out where we can visually align the gates, where we can see inside the lock in order to visually align the gates, and then figure out how far that point is offset from the real combination. If we can figure out what that offset is and we can get it consistent, and in this process, we're also gonna measure for tolerances to see how sloppy we can get. Um, we'll do a little measuring for tolerances. I'm aware of the time that we have left. Um, we're going to see you know, how much slop we have available in that system, and that will give us sort of a confidence for determining this offset when we're attacking lock in the wild. The idea being that it's often easy, sometimes even trivial, to open a dial combination lock once through shimming or uh, like a pulling attack that might be semi-destructive but still surreptitious through um, you know the keyhole on the back of it, depending on the system, so on and so forth. There might be ways to open it one time. The idea here is that we now want to go from opening it one time to having permanent access to it by deriving the actual combination. And deriving this via manipulation is its whole own thing. But if you can get your hands on the lock and remove it and then derive the combination also much more quickly than you would be able to with manipulation, um, all the better. Okay, so let's see if we can get this set up correctly. All right. Fabulous. So first we'll just um, shim this open, as said. Now what you'll notice is that I have drilled a hole into the side of it, 
that is not part of the attack. You don't need to drill a hole into the side of a $2 padlock in order to open it. Uh, it's just the easiest way to provide enough light for the camera to see. But really, ambient light is good enough when you're looking through this. Um, so this is more for the camera than anything else. All right, so we slide our shim in. If any of you don't know how to do can shimming, really easy to look it up. There's 100 demos of this on YouTube, so feel free to track that down after. Um, it's very similar to credit carding a door. All right, so let's see if we can get the light right in here. One of the reasons that I really, really love this incredibly inexpensive padlock is that for some reason, the wheels inside are color-coded. I have my red wheel, my white wheel, and my metal wheel. So makes it really nice for teaching this sort of attack and also nice visual. So what I'm looking at inside of here are the actual wheels of the, uh, of the wheel pad. We're literally watching the tumbler spinning around inside of this. Now what we want to do is dial them in such a way that we can see their gates. And I'll show you a gate in just a moment, but so that we can see their gates um, and line their gates up visually. Now this won't be our actual combination, but the gates will give us, um, as long as the gates are in the same position as one another, that will allow us to determine their final position as well. All right, so look, follow the red wheel in the middle. As that comes around, we can see this large gap cut out of the red wheel. That gap is our gate. Now, our goal here is that we want to create a visual alignment of all of those gates together. This won't be our actual combination, but what we're going to do is write down what the combination is that we are witnessing. OK, so first we're going to leave our white wheel behind. Waiting for the gate to come up. Oh, here comes the gate. I'm going to rest the forward end of the gate kind of right at where my locking dog is. All right. Get. I'm going to go one more time around just for clarity's sake for myself. There it comes. OK, right there. Fabulous. All right, going back in the opposite direction. You'll see this metal wheel on the far right beginning to turn first. There's its gate going by, but we're not worried about that yet. Once it goes far enough, the red wheel will start turning. It's going to go nice and slow. And I'm going to once again try to line that red gate up so the bottom of it is sitting kind of right at the locking dog. Oh, how funny. Bear with me. We're going to set up the, the white one one more time. The reason being, I forgot to actually look at the number on the dial. I got so into just dialing them in. All right, there we go. So bottom of that gate set against the locking dog. And what I'm seeing on the dial is 36.5. Now, the tolerances in this lock are um, you know, wide enough that I'm not too worried about getting that exact. So I am going to pick one or the other. Looks like it might be a little closer to 36. If I were attacking something that had a uh, higher tolerance, I would definitely keep track of the half cuts. All right, so that's in. I'm going to turn back in the opposite direction until I pick up that red wheel. There we go. So it's the middle one, picking up the red plastic. Here comes its gate. And once again, setting the, the gate out there. My apologies. Fabulous. All right, so where the dial is right now is at a 16. So my numbers so far are 36 and 16, and now I just have the metal wheel to go. Now, obviously, my angle changed a little bit here, so fingers crossed that I wind up uh, with these observed close enough to one another. I'm going to turn back once again in the opposite direction until I see the gate of the metal wheel. I'm going to try to align that right with the other three. All right, so right there, I am seeing a 31. So my numbers are 36, 16, 31. Now, the rest of this is just making some more observations and then doing some incredibly simple math. So once again, we want to be uh, investigating a lock that we already have a combination for before we go out 
<laughs> Sorry about the uh, the camera work there. That was god awful, but I appreciate you sticking through it. Um, so my actual combination for this is 21 to 17. 21 to 17. So what I am going to do to figure out the offset, the distance between my observed combination versus my real combination, I'm just going to subtract the actual combination from my observed combination. Cool. So 36 minus 21 equals 15. 16 minus 2 equals 14. And 31 minus 17 equals, once again, 14. Okay, so my observed combination where I was able to visually align the gates minus where the gates actually need to be along the dial in order for the lock to open, then gives me my offset. Now, quite frankly, this is the closest these numbers have been in the last many times that I've done this. Um, often, what I will find is that I have like a 15, a 13, a 12, so on and so forth. All you then do, if your offsets are off from one another, is average them. Now, in this case, I have two 14s and a 15, so I'm just going to pick the number 14. Okay, this last part might seem silly, but this is how we determine if there's enough slop in the system for our like rough and ready visual decoding to be successful if we were to try this out in the real world on a lock that we didn't have a combination for. So even though I know the combination for the lock that I am opening here, what I'm going to do instead, I will now subtract my offset from my observations. That will give me a slightly different set of numbers. I am then going to use those numbers to attempt to open the lock that I have, which is to say, I am going to attempt to open my lock with numbers that are slightly off from its real combination, numbers that I've derived from that observation. Because that's what I would be doing in the wild if I were actually opening a lock like this and making those observations. I don't know what the real number is, but because I've studied a duplicate of that lock, I can assume that the offset will be exactly the same. Admittedly, my offset's gonna be a little bit uh, wacky, especially because I knocked the camera over and came at it from a different angle. I can't even believe that the offsets are as close as they are after that. And again, my apologies for those watching. <clears throat> but this is sort of our, our last little test of this. And we'll see if we get a combination. So 36 minus 15. Oh, no, 36 minus 14, because that is the offset number that we're going with. Your offset number should be the same. So that's exactly it, right? Like I'm not 100% sure why 15 was my first one. I'm not 100% why sometimes that I get a 12. It's all about where I'm seeing it. And that's a really rough way to try to align things, right? If I needed a very high level of accuracy, there might be other things that I would do, like inserting a probe through there so that I could have a more even line across them, um, using a different visual identifier, uh, scoping it. In fact, instead of using an uh, ambient view, if I weren't looking at the scope, I probably would have had even more variation in this, admittedly. But effectively, if we needed to increase the accuracy of that offset to get it perfect, we would also have to increase the fidelity of our attack. And that's just the nature of studying a system to attack it. Um, and quite frankly, in building a system to begin with, regardless. So 36 minus 14 uh, gives me 22. That took longer than it should have. Uh, 16 minus 14 equals 2. And 31 minus 14 equals 17. All right. So my original combination, 21 to 17, the combination I'm actually going to attempt to dial. Admittedly, not very far off, just 22 to 17. Now, the expectation is that this offset was consistent enough. This should open just fine. But even if we had a bigger variation and had to run 13 or, or something similar and had numbers off in either direction, our hope is that the fidelity of this is enough that we'll still be able to open it. Regardless, 22 to 17. 22. 2. 17. Ta -da. So again, we would expect the tolerances on a lock like this to be open enough that that would work just fine. 
<clears throat> but the important thing here is the method that we're going about this, how we're learning about the lock, how we're taking what we understand of those tolerances and other mechanical limitations, and actually putting it into an attack and not only an attack against an individual lock that we're trying to get into, but understanding how we would attack an entire system of locks, and even more so, finding a way to gain permanent access to a lock. And that's not just because it's faster and more convenient to have permanent access. It's not just because the key is in fact the best lock pick for any lock. It's also because of exactly what we talked about at the outset. As soon as that first door seal was made, we had something that took us from familial, verbal, cultural shibboleth, the signifier that we are in that group, and we tokenized it. And now today, there's a, something very different about walking up to a lock on a locker and fiddling with it for 10 minutes as you try to get it open, or cutting up a soda can to make a shim to pop the stupid thing open, versus walking up to it and simply putting in the correct combination because you've previously decoded it. Now, obviously there are different settings and times when you would have to do each of these things, but the important thing is that it takes this effort of entry and decoding that might have to happen in a surreptitious way, but then it allows you to access something in an incredibly public way. And as you access it by using the right combination on the locker, by using the right key to get into the secure room, by using a valid badge to get through the turnstile at the office. All of those things are signifiers of your authority and your sort of a belonging to the group that you're trying to access. And this, this modern method of, of blending our, our social engineering and physical pen testing worlds to really create that token of authority out of the decoding of that physical gatekeeper. That's 6,000 years old. That was a change in how society is built and that creation of the semi-private space and the definition of a group of people based on their access to a semi-private space. So, locks are pretty rad. Uh, I continue to think so. This is, um, uh, uh, you know, a long way to go through a lot of areas of research that I'm really excited about, but hopefully it also has proved to be uh, a fun reintroduction to some of the work that I've been doing, some of the stuff that I uh, hope to continue doing in the future. And that's it. I got my timings right. We hit an hour. I almost can't believe it. All right. That's the end of the talk. Feel free to bounce. But if any of you have questions, toss them up in the chat, and I'll feel and I'll gladly answer them. Um, I'll scroll back a little bit, but uh, ju just toss them in there. <clears throat> and thank you all. Thank you all so much. Oh, thanks. Kale was pointing out that I got my to the powers of incorrect. I'm not shocked. That's the sort of thing I do regularly. Agreed, agreed that it would be incredibly cool to talk with the original inventors of these things. Um, so, um, you know, Don's Locks points out that they were very clever and had no computers to assist. And that actually is something that I get really excited about. Um, you know, as fascinating as lock picking has always been to me and this process of discovery and, and researching those things, I think there can be a real genius to that. This was, you know, a very simple example that I used to teach my students when we go from picking one lock to thinking about key space and key space reduction and, and how to design an attack. But the people that do that against complex systems, um, you know, the people that I've known and loved in my life that do this work are absolutely incredible. And I think there's real genius to it. And also, the genius to hold something new in your head as you try to figure out how everything are going to work together, describe it on paper, play with it in metal and wood and, and get everything to come together, I think is, it is another type and a really fascinating type of genius. Um, and in, in particular, you know, that is a genius, they both are, that often outpace the technology that are available to them. So in the case of Brahma, as a lot of us know, um, Brahma had the designs for the Brahma safety lock well before he could actually produce it. Took a man named Maudsley, um, who was a, another young engineer and machinist to actually design tools and molds that 
were precise enough that could actually make this lock that Brahma had built in his mind, you know? Uh, so the fact that these people could even outpace the technology that was available to them to create something is amazing. And also turns out to be a really amazing reason to look back at very, very old patents because he's not the only one that was able to do this. The number of really great ideas that exist in the deep history of the patent record that weren't able to be produced or produced inexpensively enough or produced at a large enough scale for their time with the technology they had available, there's a ton of them. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that could make a really cool lock today, but wasn't successful in its time just for outpacing in thought the technology available to build the thing. And I'm sure this holds true of all sorts of industry, um, but you know, I, I study locks. All right. Excellent. Some folks doing live vids. Awesome. Yeah, Rocky was saying, can see the appeal of seeing something like that in physical form. Quite frankly, I would love at some point. So there are a number of them that I think that we could successfully recreate at this point, um, either from clear enough patent descriptions that we've been able to recover or transcribe um, that give us a, a clear enough view to probably not interpret the scale that the lock was meant to be made at, but at least understand how the various components would work together. Aesthetically, it would certainly be different than what is being described, but the mechanics of it, I think we can successfully pull off. And then similarly, those that we have illustrations for, but have been able to puzzle out their function, um, those I think we can definitely create um, actual copies of. Uh, and I think that it would be, I think it would be rad to roll into a museum and get to play with not only like modern and interesting locks from various points in the history of the lock, but also see these pieces that have been completely lost, but have real relation to, and sometimes even inspiration for various other systems that we're now more familiar with and, and can explore. Awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hardest Bodhi uh, referring to um, the technical request from that old Shikatu lock for somebody asking for help to uh, put their pin back in the right position uh, throughout. I bet ten dollars is the first evidence of a dupe is trying to pick their own front door, uh, and that is hilarious. Stephen, how are you? Yes, it was totally decon. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but yeah, no, that's I, I am honestly incredibly curious to find records and evidence of people bypassing these locks. Um, there is actually some interesting stuff out there regarding um, uh, potentially apocryphal, but decently uh, um, uh, well um, regarded. They've been around a long time and multiple people have told these stories. Um, but in particular, there's one of a man that would seal his uh, pantry at night with a ring and he found that his um, servants were able to get that ring off of his finger while he was sleeping, break in, take what they wanted and then reseal it, put it back on his finger and it took him a very long time to figure out that this was happening. Realized that this was happening and so he has a brilliant idea of after he seals it at the end of the day, throwing his ring inside of it through a little door because of course you don't need the ring to get in, you physically break the seal to get in. So how could somebody uh, reseal it um, without the key, uh, but of course you just break the seal on the door and then you have the key, and then you throw it back in again at the end. Um, anyway, it's a fun story. Lord knows if it was actually true, but that's kind of the oldest in antiquity that I can find of somebody uh, creating and, and successfully carrying out an attack on one of these sorts of technologies. I'm sure they're out there and both incredibly and also infuriatingly, the cuneiform corpus uh, far outstrips the total Latin corpus that we have in the world, but the pace of its translation is incredibly slow and its success of the accessibility of that translation to the public is actually really good, but the tools to interpret it and understand it can be a little bit difficult um, without prior knowledge. So this is all to say, there's a lot of words out there and a good number of them will be about some sort of security technology. Um, but the pace at which these things are being um, decoded and transcribed probably means that I will only get a few more glimpses in my lifetime of, uh, of possible, you know, attacks and other designs and whatnot. All right. Oh, uh, Rocky, I'll toss the, um, uh, as a matter of fact, here, I'll toss this into the chat. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So uh, there was a request for that paper by 
from Adas Elizabeth. I'll toss it right in the chat. And then after the talk, now that I got through everything I thought I would, I'll put up a lot in the description of it after the fact. I'll put up a lot of those links. So if you revisit this um, in a day or two, you should be able to see many of the things that I described, including the various patents and whatnot. Awesome. Excellent. All right. Mm. So uh, Rocky again throws out thinking about how seals were started and when uh, and how that leads to what I said about the early locksmith and the terminologies makes me wonder what the terminology of tooling to pick early locks are. Yeah, and that's actually a super fascinating question, right? Because we have, now that we have the terminology to describe the various components of the lock, will we someday find that constellation of terms in somebody like, asking for assistance or describing how something was opened or whatever the case may be that, you know, further uses some other terminology that somebody is using to describe whatever the tool is that somebody tried to open it with or repair it with or whatever the case may be. Um, even, you know, how did they handle it destructively? I mean, for the most part, this was wood stapled into a door. And so you can imagine the destructive defeat for it. Um, but yeah, being able to then use what we know of the terms that describe the technology, hopefully, you know, well, my greatest wish is that we'll then be able to see the terms um, describing the engagement with the technology and maybe be able to for some sort of uh, tooling that, that manipulates them as well to find some of that earliest uh, of that back and forth. Awesome. Um, Tim throws out, some, this suggests something very interesting about the muddy world of ceramic culture. Uh, agreed, and honestly, the, the number of things, so the further we get away from locks, the less I know about anything in the world, but because it turns out that locks are uh, everywhere and have been forever, almost everywhere, and it's even more fascinating when they're not somewhere, um, I've had the chance to see like 20 other things that I could stop everything today and spend the rest of my life trying to understand, and I would be really, really, really happy. Um, thankfully, locks keep delivering, and so I haven't had to go somewhere else for that dopamine hit. But the number of things that you come across that are absolutely fascinating when you choose something that has this much of a uh, geographical, temporal, and cultural through line as security technology, um, it's bonkers, the sort of things that you come across and you start to wonder about and you really want to go diving into. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> BZ Customs throws out that seeing the Egyptian lock in physical form makes him understand the locks in oblivion much better. For sure, for sure. And actually, there's something really fascinating um, called the Museum of uh, Mechanics Lock Picking Edition. Um, and they've got a couple of these, but this is fabulous. This is from Dimble Games. Um, it is, bu, 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 bum. there you go. Um, so this is, in fact, a, an amazing resource if you want to study how entry uh, or how lock picking specifically works in games, and then from there extrapolating on uh, entry and whatnot. Um, I got to give a, a, a private talk about um, uh, entry in video gaming <clears throat> a little while back, and I made use of this fabulous museum of lock picking mechanics. Uh, you install it, uh, you know, works for Windows, Apple, Linux, et cetera, and you just walk around as though in a museum and you can read about the various mechanics and then you can play mini games from dozens of different games that have involved some sort of lock picking mechanic. Absolutely fascinating. There is almost nothing that corresponds to the real world, but the way in which various people have tried to accomplish the feeling of lock picking and trying to uh, you know, create that as a, a digital experience is, is amazing. And a fabulous research for any of those that research it. <clears throat> Davian, what's up? Thank you so much. Uh, and very glad to have this recorded. Uh, Deb Thur is at thinking about physical security as authority. My woman elders with rings of keys tucked into the waist of their saris or of group belonging, her students casually placing, uh, casually prox carding into campus spaces. Yeah, I mean, honestly, once you once you scratch the surface of these things, it um, especially that especially that tangible component, right? I mean, it's well known uh, that you know throughout the Bible there are descriptions of people with keys slung over their shoulders, and it is 
explicitly a sign of their authority. Um, you know, Athena is depicted as having the key to Athens. That's like, despite her being a god and the you know city named for her, it still gave her a key because it is the token of authority. Um, and yeah, it is often so, we, we are now so occupied with so many of these semi-private or semi-public spaces, the semi-private ones being the ones where you have to have some form of authenticity to get in and out of, uh, some authentication rather, um, that it has created an incredibly casual relationship with these things that do turn out to be explicit signifiers of your belonging to whatever group similarly occupies the semi-private space. Awesome. All right, we are caught up on that. If anybody has a, a last thought, feel free to toss it in there. Um, but this was an absolute pleasure. Um, pretty much everything that I've talked about with each of the five locks that we've explored, I could you know, gleefully do an hour on and I need to be writing a lot more. All of that said, I am going to uh, be gone for a little while because I'm about to have my second kid, which is awesome. Uh, so uh, we're welcoming our second daughter into the world in just about a month. One of the big reasons that I wanted to get this in, having reconnected with the community and um, just finding that there are still so many wonderful people carrying this torch and who seem genuinely excited to welcome me back uh, and who are just so incredibly kind. Um, I really wanted to make sure I got the opportunity to do something like this before I bounce for a few months while I get to know my new kiddo um, and then uh, start putting up some of the other things that I've been learning and discovering and trying over the last many years. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Simon, that's my goal. Absolutely my goal. Ghost, unfortunately, no. NDE mag was amazing. And quite frankly, I think that I maintained the domains for it. If you or anyone you know wants to carry the torch for it, feel free. I try to make everything that I produce CC zero. I'm a big believer in people being able to take the things that I've um, come up with, thought through, et cetera, and be able to use them for whatever. Um, I, all I really wanna do is be like digging in the sand and throwing treasure on the shore and letting people do whatever the hell they want with it because I know that I won't be able to do enough with all of this before I am gone. Um, and so the more that anyone can do with anything that I've come up with is, uh, is wonderful. So yeah, hit me up. Um, if, if you or anyone you know might have an interest, you're welcome to the domain. You're welcome to the original like InDesign files or whatever it is that you would want. Um, you know, carry that torch. That's great. Awesome. Thank you for all the congrats. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, oh, and you know, just for simplicity's sake, because I realized that I've been so out of it that even my uh, website has been effectively non-functional, st at skylartown.com does still get through to me. So if any of you have any questions following up from this, um, please feel free. Uh, or if you want to grab NDE mag, both myself and the other founder aren't going to do anything with it. And we've both come to terms with that. So feel free. All right. Uh, Andrew, yeah, the talk will totally stay on YouTube. Um, I don't know. I, it's listed as public anyway. So I think the moment it processes, it will be available. And then I'll go in and deal with the description and put some more stuff up in there. Uh, probably tonight. Um, tomorrow, heading up to, to see family. Uh, one last time while we can still travel before the kid comes. Yeah. Amazing to see all of you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Thank you for, for attending. And uh, I'm very excited to, to continue to engage and to, to get some more of what I've been doing out there. All right. Thanks, everyone. I love you. I like you. Have a great night or day, wherever you are.